As we all know, teachers are essential and often instrumental to a child's academic progress and towards their future, and as such, high expectations are placed on our teachers. But even with such expectation, we continue to wildly uh, underestimate the importance of our teachers, and in my view, we wildly underpay them too, but that's for another day. Now, in the words of the uh, Pulitzer Prize-winning author, and Limerickman, Frank McCourt, who taught for over 30 years in New York's high schools, quote, teaching is the downstairs maid of professions. Teachers are told to use the service door or go round the back, end of quote. Frank McCourt uh, is the author of the international bestseller Angela's Ashes and his second memoir, Tis. His latest bestseller is called Teacher Men, and yes, it's all about teaching and the importance of storytelling. Frank McCourt, welcome to the studio. Uh, This is a story about how teaching made you the man you are and in a sense set you free. Tell us about that. Tell us what happened. Well, it's a a peculiar thing. You you go to a a school, you go to a university to get what they call an education. But in my experience, I didn't get any. I didn't get much of an education. The main thing is learning about yourself. I think that's what literature is all about, all the stories all the way back to the Anglo-Saxons and Chaucer and so on, all about the journey that everybody, everybody makes, a journey towards understanding and liberation. I think late, late in my life, I, 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 something, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night, tossing and turning on the pillow. Then I suddenly realize, and this, this is what James Joyce would call an epiphany, a sudden realization of something. Mm-hmm. I was a baby. I was just put... I, I came into this world uh, as a baby. I, I, I wasn't born to be an Irishman or to be Catholic, or to be American, or anything else. All of this stuff is imposed on you. And that was a big, huge discovery for me. Oh, so what the hell is going on here? They made me Irish, they made me Catholic, they made me American. Now I have to cast all that off and start all over again. And as a teacher, I, I, I sensed this. I didn't know this when I was teaching, but I, I, I figured the purpose of teaching is to help liberate young minds. And it's very hard because... It's very hard work for anybody to say, well, I'm, I'm going to find out who I am. So people go into therapy. Or people accept various religions, or Catholicism, or, or Islam, or anything. It's easier that way than to go off on your own journey. Actually, it's interesting uh, from your book that, that you, you talk about the fact that uh, during your ye- years as a teacher, uh, that you developed a skill uh, for uh, storytelling and uh, that was the method in which you, you, you taught the children. Um, but it's interesting uh, that, uh, that you should develop your, your skills as a storyteller while at the same time learning so much about yourself. Well, that's what, in a sense, that's what I grew up with. Storytelling is what I grew up with because we had nothing else. We didn't have any radio or television or anything like that. Books were scarce. Magazines and newspapers practically non-existent. We couldn't afford them, so... We would sit around the fire when we had a fire when, we, when I was a kid. My mother was there. My father was gone. He, but when he was there, it was all stories, stories, stories. Dad would tell us a story, and he'd make up a story about one of the neighbors or two of the neighbors. He'd make it right out of his head, which, which was amazing. And, and, and we'd sit there listening to him. And even when, even when I was a, a kid, and my mother might have a friend of hers, over for tea or something like that. My father had a friend. I used to sit and listen. I'm supposed to be in bed, but we, we, I, I come in and sit on, on, on the steps listening to them because I found the talk of adults fascinating. Nowadays, kids don't listen to adults at all, but I found their stories fascinating. In the book, uh, you, you discuss the fact at length that uh, you felt that storytelling was, in fact, the best way for you to teach children, you'd given up sort of using books and uh, using the standard uh, methods uh, for teaching, uh, and then uh, developed your own unique uh, way of communicating with uh, the kids. And um, you discovered, you say, uh, that uh, storytelling was the best way to be what you were, a teacher man. They resist. <laughs> it's a function of the young to resist uh, all the people. So, and, and, and they would resist. And I was up against it. I was very frustrated all the time. How the hell do I get through to them? And I think the opportunity was handed me a number of times in, in things that they said. And even though I, I 
the teaching was very hard. One thing that I had to give myself credit for, I knew how to, I knew how to grab the ball and run with it. it. And a lot of it was saving my own life as a teacher. I wasn't good at teaching grammar in the beginning. I, and you know, you know what they're doing? If they stay, they, they're very canny. If they sense a way of getting you off the subject, they'll do it. Like, the, you, you know, if, if, I, if, they had the, uh, if they thought that I was going to give them a spelling list, they start asking me about my life. And, did it, and one of them would say, hey, Mr. McCord, did you ever do real work? <laughs> I said, what the hell do you think I'm doing here facing you every day? No, I mean real work uh, uh, that a man would do. And then I would tell them about the, the jobs that I had in the docks, in the warehouses. And, oh, that brought me new respect because here is a man who actually lifted things and loaded trucks and unloaded trucks and ships. When you realized that uh, you were so gifted uh, as a storyteller and how the, the kids actually so enjoyed your storytelling uh, skills. And then there's an interesting line in the book where you say, my life saved my life. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's what happened because I, didn't ha I don't have any... I <clears throat> didn't have any expertise in any other area. All I knew was my life. No, wait a minute. I thought I knew my life. I didn't. I, I, because I had dismissed my life as a kind of a miserable, miserable epic of poverty and Catholicism and alcoholism and, 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 and sordidness in Ireland. But they started asking me about my life, and they seemed to be. They, seemed, they were about 50% interested. But the most. 50% interest, uh, but also trying to keep me off the subject of, of technical English. You say early on in your book that, um, that there should be a medal uh, for people who survive miserable childhoods. And you further say that uh, you, in fact, should be uh, the first in line uh, to receive such a medal. And in fact, you did get that medal because you're, you're, the kids gave you uh, an award or a medal for being uh, the best teacher of the year. Did that make you uh, feel a little better about life? Well, it's all—it's terrific when you're teaching. Because sometimes uh, some of us who, who are teachers are, and the public will stress the negative aspects of teaching. But it's very hard to write about, uh, I suppose, the moments in a classroom when you feel absolutely exhausted, you make a connection, you make a big breakthrough, as I did a few times, which would send me home floating on air. Because I, that, and you know it, every teacher will tell you, or maybe any performer knows when you have an audience, they were suddenly, they look up at you, my God, there's something going on here. We understand something, and, and we're enjoying something. That's, that's the, the, these are the, the rewards for teaching. We're certainly not, you know, we, we can't rely on a huge salary or anything like that, or, or the, the esteem of the public, but you know in the classroom when you've hit pay dirt. Frank, why did you become a teacher? Was it um, a calling or a vocation, or was it a status thing? Yeah, it wasn't status. I knew even, I knew even then there was the, 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 <coughs> the image of the teacher was not, it did not glow in America. So, and I, and I, I, I couldn't work for a corporation. I was offered a job in a bank, and I didn't see myself putting on a suit and a tie every morning, getting out the old briefcase, and going and sitting there for 25 years and then dying. So I, I put together my, 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 my great appreciation, my relish for books and children and put the two together. Then I thought that all I had to do was walk into the classroom and start teaching. Boy, I soon found out otherwise. It's not like that one bit. You just don't walk into the classroom and start teaching mm -hmm. because they're there and they're watching you and it's their job to bring you down if possible. <laughs> they're not saying this consciously. It's just the role they have, and it, it's so ancient, it's, it's so primitive, because it, it, they're, they're, <laughs> their job is to push you off the planet. And even though I was only 10 years older than, than my kid, uh, students at the time. There are a lot of uh, funny anecdotes in your book, uh, but one of the more interesting and more funny ones is uh, what you write about uh, the excuse notes. Uh, that the kids used to bring in if they didn't do their homework or whatever and they had these excuse notes and you never really reprimanded them for it um, because you felt that some of the excuse notes were, were hilarious to the extreme let me quote one of them 
a man died uh, in the bathroom upstairs and the water overflowed and splashed all over Johnny's homework. And here's another one. Um, a stove went on fire and uh, the house burnt down and the fire brigade came and they kept us out of the house all night. And one of my favorites was Arnold. Uh, I'm just working off memory here. Arnold uh, was getting off the train on his way to school or on his way home from school and um, uh, his train got, or his, his school bag got caught on the train and uh, the train took off taking his school bag with him. Now the million dollar question, Frank, is how in the name of God did you know that these were all fakes? How did I what? How did you know that they were fakes? How did I? Uh, well, I knew all the excuse notes. Most of the excuse notes were fake. They were written, written by the mothers would say, oh, you need, you need an excuse note for yesterday, honey. You write it yourself and I'll sign it. So they would write it. But, and they'd sign these notes and they'd never look at them. And I, I started looking at them. I had a drawer full of them and they were absolutely fantastic, creative, imaginative. And uh, they, 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 they went wild with their, with their excuses. You know, trucks were crashing into the sides, the sides of houses, ceilings were collapsing, boilers exploding, all of this stuff was going on, all made up. And I, I, I knew um, one of the kids named Mikey Dolan, I could see him uh, writing an excuse note right under my nose. And, and, he was, and, and he was using his left hand because he had gone to Catholic schools. And at Catholic schools, the nuns insisted on handsome handwriting. They didn't care what you did. You could marry a Protestant or anything like that. They didn't care about that as long as your handwriting was clear and handsome. So, and Mikey was there right under my nose writing an excuse note. And he didn't sort of grab him by the collar or by the scruff of the neck and say, you know, I don't believe a word of this. You have to, you have to adjust to the little things that go on. It's not a matter of morality or ethics. You have to understand and you have to understand there's a routine there are little things you, you, you let go. And also, what a lot of people don't understand about teaching is you're more than a teacher. You have to make moral and ethical decisions. For instance, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, when there was such civil rights movement was so hot in the USA, and a black kid might come in and say, you know, well, you know, I, I, uh, we we're poor and... Uh, I couldn't do my homework because the TV was blaring. My mom and dad were fighting. Could you give me a break? Could you give me some more time to do that paper or something? And then, then you have to make a decision. Some teachers will say, look, you, get in the set, you, you have to adhere to the same set of rules and standards as everybody else. I'm sorry about your home life, but I can't give you a break. If I give you a break, I have to give everybody else a break. These are decisions you have to make. Frank, this is really a book... Uh for teachers, by a teacher. Are teachers lapping this up now? Well, the t teachers, uh, I believe that now it's on the reading list at Harvard University. Uh, and I think teachers, I, wrote, I think I wrote it for teachers. I'd like teachers to read it because it's, it's the inside story which you'll never get from Hollywood or for generally from, from books and novels about teachers. As a matter of interest, I'm sure you have a lot of opinions about teaching to this day, even though you're a long time retired now. Um, there's a drift now where um, kids are, our parents are taking their kids uh, from public schools and sending them to private schools. And How do you feel about that, the, the, the movement, if you like, of, of I suppose, the more well-off um, kids in our society have uh, been taken from uh, the public schools and placed in private schools? Well, I think, I think uh, the middle classes are betraying the school system. I, I, I can understand why you wouldn't want to have your, your kid in, 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 a, in a tough, rowdy, dangerous school. But at the same time, I think they ought to go back and take back the schools instead of having to pay these ex exorbitant prices for private, high, for private schools. And finally, uh, everyone that knows you knows you as a, a best-selling author, but is Frank McCourt secretly still a teacher at heart? Oh, yeah, I can't, I, because I love going back to schools and I love talking to, to, to kids because I think they're my favourite audience. The kids in the schools and the teachers they're in. Frank McCourt, thank you for uh, agreeing to the interview.